The role of the medical doctor and researcher is to provide the best possible treatment for the sick. Our medical icons have been pioneers in their respective fields, going beyond the call of duty and excelling to become outstanding figures in our society. They have brought our region international acclaim. Their pioneering work and unsurpassed achievements span the globe. These are our Caribbean icons in medicine who have made us proud. Sir George Alain. This distinguished Barbadian scholar is noted in the Caribbean region and the world at large for his work in public health and the combat of HIV AIDS. An early expert on malnutrition, he did extensive research on this disease which was once prevalent and poorly understood in our region. The distinguished medical career of Sir George Alain is punctuated by numerous firsts. He is the first Caribbean person to become the director of the Pan American Health Organization, the first University of the West Indies graduate to hold the title of Chancellor, and the first West Indian to be appointed the Sir Arthur Sims Commonwealth Travelling Professor. But despite these great achievements, he has remained humble and insists that he did not do it alone. So I would have said that the things that really impacted on me, that have stood me in good stead over the years would be, one, the love for books, uh, two, a sense of timing and discipline, I believe in that, and three, this idea that you can't do anything alone. No one ever does anything alone. You always, you always do things in a family or in a group. Born on October 7th, 1932 in St. Philip, Barbados, Sir George's childhood was governed by discipline and a strong sense of family values that he credits for shaping his life. My father was a sticker for a time. If it was one o'clock, it was not two minutes past one. It was one o'clock. He was a disciplinarian, my father was. He didn't stand for any nonsense. Interestingly, Sir George pursued the classics at Harrison College, then upon receiving a scholarship in 1951 to study anywhere in the world, he decided on taking up medicine at the University College of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. I suppose my love for people uh, was being very helpful and that probably helped me to choose a profession which I would react with uh, people. And then after doing the classics, I knew no science. So I spent one year additional, between the time I got a scholarship, the time I went in, I did some science. Then I went off to university and went into medicine. He graduated in 1957 with a Bachelor of Medicine as a gold medalist and proceeded to do his internship at the Old General Hospital in Barbados. After acquiring his doctorate in internal medicine from the University of London in 1965, he began lecturing at University of the West Indies Barbados and started research at the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit on Malnutrition and Renal Physiology. This led to the publication of a manual used by PAHO entitled Protein Energy Malnutrition. What things cause malnourished children, for example, to become swollen, for example? What things cause malnourished children to have uh, impaired heart, to have heart problems, for example? Those kinds of things we worked on a lot. And also I did some experimental work with experimental animals, rats. And I always tell a funny story about my working with rats. That my little daughter then, sometimes I had to feed my rats at night. And I would take my daughter with me up to the lab and she would see me feed these rats. So one day, they were at a little birthday party and all these little children around and what does your father do, what does your father do? This one's father was a professor, this one's father was insurance. When it came to my daughter, she said, my daddy feeds rats. After a decade of extensive research, he amassed 144 publications in scientific journals, which qualified him, at the relatively young age of 40, to be appointed Professor of Medicine in 1972 and later Chair of the Department of Medicine. During his tenure, he helped develop a formal postgraduate program and encouraged medical research. There's no greater thrill than, a few greater thrills than trying to explain something to a young person and then see in their eyes that they get the concept you're trying to put across. When I left the university, people asked me, what did you miss? Did you miss your patients? Did you miss your research? Did you miss your students? My number one response always was, I, it's the students I miss most. 
Sir George has received numerous awards for his decades of work and medical research, like the Pelican Award from the University of the West Indies for his contribution to education and the Centenary Medal in Jamaica for his medical achievements. In 1990, he was made Knight Bachelor by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and in 2001, he was awarded the Order of the Caribbean Community. Though now retired, Sir George still remains busy as he serves on the Task Force on Healthcare in the Caribbean and is also a United Nations Special Envoy to combat HIV-AIDS in the Caribbean. I say to youngsters, look, if you put your... majority of times you put your mind to it, you can do it. Thank God not everyone wants to be a scientist. But those who have an aptitude, the only, only advice you give is to work hard at it because the rewards come from if from working hard. The effort you put into it, you get out of it in terms of the, of, the, of, the, of the rewards. And you mightn't believe it at the time, but your teachers usually know more than you do. So listen to them. <laughs> Sir Kenneth Standard. The Pan American Health Organization hailed him as the public health hero of the Americas. Born in Barbados in 1920, Sir Kenneth Standard was known for his tremendous contribution to public health. He also conducted extensive studies on child nutrition and child mortality rates. As a young man, Sir Kenneth attended one of the top boys' schools in his home country, Harrison College. He taught at Lynch's Secondary School in Barbados for eight years before being promoted to headmaster. However, at the time of the promotion, he was selected to join the first batch of 33 medical students of the new University College of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. In 1955, he graduated with his medical degree and became a medical house officer at the University College Hospital. In 1959, he attained his master's degree in public health from the Graduate School of Public Health of the University of Pittsburgh on a PAHO WHO Fellowship. Three years later, he earned his degree of Doctor of Medicine from the University of London for research on child nutrition in Jamaica and Barbados. Sir Kenneth believed that medical health officers were key to maintaining a country's primary health care and he worked in this capacity in Barbados from 1958 to 1961. In 1961, he returned to Jamaica, his adopted homeland, to lecture at Mona in the Division of Social and Preventative Medicine, becoming its head within five years. During his tenure, he developed postgraduate training in public health and renamed the division the Department of Community Health and Psychiatry. He started a health aids program in August Town, in which volunteer doctors and nurses provided short training courses in healthcare to groups of citizens and a clinic in Mona, run by the University of the West Indies medical students to service people in August Town and Bedward. Sir Kenneth developed a manual for community health workers which after three decades still serves as the Bible of social and preventative medicine. A former chairman of the WHO Task Force on Research in Health Education in Family Health, he was made a commander of the Order of Distinction in 1976 by the Jamaican government and in 1982 he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen in recognition of invaluable work in public health. Dr. Arthur Cecil Cyrus. A national hero to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Arthur Cecil Cyrus is largely responsible for reforming healthcare in that country. Trained as a general surgeon, Dr. Cyrus worked long hours to reduce the backlog of patients requiring surgery from disfiguring diseases such as tumors. He also specialized in skin graft surgery, which he performed using equipment he made himself. Born on January 6, 1929 in the coastal village of Leyu, St. Vincent, Cyrus knew from the tender age of seven that he wanted to become a doctor. In those days of the 1930s, there was a, a rather iniquitous uh, setup where the doctor came in his white sports car at 11 o'clock. He went to the rectory where those of us needing attention were. And he, those who could pay the shilling got to see him and by 12 o'clock he left and this saddened my childhood heart. I thought this is unfair and so I, I vowed to become a doctor. He attended the St. Vincent Boys Grammar School and excelled in the classics and history. Determined to fulfill his dream of becoming a doctor, he set out to conquer the sciences. So, stepwise I planned. I bought the necessary textbooks and I began to teach myself those subjects. 
within six months, I took the Cambridge School Certificate in, the, in um, Chemistry and Biology and I got distinction, two A's. He was successful in his external examinations and migrated to the United Kingdom in 1950. The United Kingdom was a known territory for Cyrus, but he soon warmed up to his studies at the Queen's University of Belfast and was awarded a first exam scholarship. In 1953, he became the first overseas student to be awarded the coveted Johnson Symington Medal in Anatomy. In 1954, he graduated with his BSc in Anatomy and qualified as a surgeon in 1961, specializing in ophthalmology. After 13 years of living in England, Dr. Cyrus returned home and was shocked by the primitive conditions of the hospitals. So he immediately embarked on a crusade to overhaul the healthcare system. I was the first trained surgeon in the history of the island. And I detected that there was a tremendous backlog of clinical work that had to be done. It hadn't been done over the years. There were tremendous deformities of bone and joint. There were enormous tumors that people carried around. In 1976, Dr. Cyrus opened the first private hospital in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Botanic Hospital, specializing in performing eye and skin graft surgery. He also helped to set up maternal and child care clinics and to improve operating theaters and casualty departments. All this while working to reduce the backlog of patients requiring surgery at the Colonial Hospital. In 1983, Dr. Cyrus was awarded the Order of the British Empire. He was also a recipient of the Companion of the Order of St. Michael and the St. George. He is also the first Vincentian to be elected Fellow of the prestigious Royal College of Surgeons. Although retired, he opened in 2002 the Cecil Cyrus Museum of Medical Specimens, which displays the 1,000 specimens, 3,000 photographs, hundreds of x-rays, and the collection of medical instruments he collected during his four decades of practice, as well as the pathological atlas he produced in 1989. An avid sportsman, Dr. Cyrus represented his school in cricket and football. At university, he took up squash and introduced this sport to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 1981, he and his wife hosted the first Caribbean Junior Squash Championship. Over the years, he has also sought to improve the lives of young people by delivering lectures to motivate and inspire them to achieve great things. Dr. Cyrus has fulfilled his childhood dream of truly improving the quality of life of his people. He attributes his success to his wife Catherine, a nurse, and lives by the philosophy, life is beautiful, to preserve life is beautiful. Sir John Golding Born in London, England on April 15, 1921, Sir John Simon Rawson Golding was a man who passionately served the disabled in Jamaica. He treated not only broken bones but broken hearts and spirits and treated everyone with importance to raise their self-esteem. He pursued medicine at Middlesex Hospital in London and qualified as a medical doctor in 1944. Although his career was going remarkably well, Sir John ventured to Jamaica just hoping for a change. He became a senior lecturer at the University College of the West Indies where he also specialized in medical ethics and established the School of Physical Therapy. During his first six months on the island, there was a polio epidemic that left about 1,500 persons severely paralyzed. Sir John established a polio rehabilitation center. His mission was to rehabilitate persons back into a meaningful role into the society. He was one of the very few people in Jamaica who had any experience at all of working with polio because we've never had an outbreak here. He also opened a hospice for the terminally ill where they would be taken care of free of charge. Somehow or other, he derived great um, fulfillment, probably would be a good word, from that work. It was a place where people could come to and be dealt with and then leave. It wasn't residential, but he used to go to the homes of people to see them. For his outstanding work in polio rehabilitation and tropical orthopedics, he was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1959. One of Sir John's other accomplishments was the creation of the Polio Games in 1966 for polio patients. This eventually led to the establishment of the Special Olympics. For his unselfish, lifelong service to society and humanity, he was awarded the Order of Jamaica in 1974. 
1984, he was awarded the LLD Honoris Causa from the University of Toronto, Canada. In 1986, he was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen of England. Dr. Garth Taylor Dr. Garth Taylor is known as the Flying Eye Doctor. He is a volunteer surgeon and the medical director of the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital. Having flown on over 103 Orbis missions and having performed over 3,000 eye surgeries to treat blindness, he is the most traveled eye surgeon with perhaps the most impact across international borders. My interest um, is ophthalmology. You know, my, um, my, my relaxation is ophthalmology. Born in Montego Bay, Jamaica on April 29, 1944, he knew by the age of seven that he wanted to become a doctor. The young Taylor was determined to be just like his mentor, his godfather, Dr. Herbert Morrison. You know, one of the things that he did for me was to, uh, telling me how privileged, you know, I, I am to, to have the, the, the knowledge and the ambition to want to do medicine. And, um, and um, I should not abuse it. And um, he would take me around and say, look, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing for the people. They don't have to have money, you know, in order for, um, for you to treat them. You're here to um, alleviate, um, you know, sickness and make people happy. During his childhood, many experiences served to solidify his resolve to go into medicine. He attended St. James Boys Primary and at the age of 10 entered Cornwall College focusing on the sciences. He was told he could not become a doctor by his headmaster, but this did not deter him from fulfilling his dream. On completing secondary school in 1963, he worked as an operations clerk at Pan American Airways. He left the following year when he was accepted by the University of the West Indies, Mona, to study medicine. However, he did not gain a scholarship, so instead took up a Canadian scholarship to study biochemistry in Ottawa. Still haunted by his dream, he eventually returned home and with renewed determination, he applied for a scholarship and to his delight and surprise, he succeeded. Taylor came to Trinidad in his final year of medicine to work at the Port of Spain General Hospital and it was there that he met Dr. Nolly Butler and Professor Courtney Bartholomew. Uh, these uh, two people in particular were there for me and um, really made life um, easier for me and the exam was, um, was not a burden when I went to write the final exams. Adamant about deciding on an area of speciality, he left Jamaica to attend the Civic Hospital of Ottawa and the Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, to study ophthalmology. He passed the prestigious Royal College examination in ophthalmology in 1976. In 1977, he was awarded a fellowship in corneal surgery and external diseases at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami. He returned to Canada to set up his private practice in Cornwall and also worked at the Cornwall General Hospital for 24 years before becoming the Chief of Staff. Currently, he holds the title of Chief of Ophthalmology and is an Associate Professor at Queen's University, Ontario. Apart from his charitable work with Orbis treating patients, training doctors in host countries and setting up eye banks, Dr. Taylor also is the co-founder and director of another non-profit organization, CANSI, the Canadian Surgical Eye Expeditions. This organization, um, we go to different countries and we do surgery, we do volume surgery. And we find that there was such a need uh, for, for this uh, type of um, service. Mm -hmm. So myself and um, in fact Dr. Mahabir from San Fernando, um, very good friend, like a brother to me, and he and I would go to these countries and do, we'll do in a week 160 to 180 operations. We just go, you know, to the, uh, from table to table and do all this work. When Dr. Taylor is not performing operations all over the world, he enjoys baking Jamaican fruitcakes for friends and family, and he enjoys re-establishing links to Jamaica by playing dominoes, listening to the music, and most importantly, indulging in the best cuisine. I think if I were to interact with um, a youngster um, who is not sure, and most of, most of the time they're not sure what they want to do, I would say to them, um, Find yourself somebody that you like. Find yourself somebody that you interact with, somebody that you can um, 